Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 266 of Real Blend, a podcast that does 21-minute wonders in our sleep. My name is Sean O'Connell. I'm the managing editor at Cinema Blend and the co-host of the Real Blend podcast. And on this week's show, guys, have we got a good one for you. Director Andy Muschietti and his producer and sister, Barbara Muschietti, are going to join the show to discuss their new film, The Flash. So stick around for our spoiler-free reactions to the show and then in addition to it because we caught up with extraction 2 uh, starring chris hemsworth on netflix we want to dive into that as well and by we i mean kev mccarthy of fox 5 in washington dc in a new location kev how are you sir hi sean uh and and jacob yeah so it's funny just to give a little behind the scenes jake and i are currently at our stations because we're in between our shows we are both in our uh not in our normal settings uh which that's is not why true i thought one one poster behind i jake. thought jake was just a big 911 fan and had finally traded out i'm not a big 911 right. fan i'm a big call me cat fan if you guys are watching us on youtube hello thank you so much for joining us make sure you go down and hit subscribe i really hope you are because otherwise that whole rant we did about the posters in the room that we're in makes no sense whatsoever i didn't even think about that yeah <laughs> i always automatically assume that people have the video aspect to the show waiting for them. but really you should be watching us on youtube because that's where the directors show up and that's where you get to see all of our handsome faces so go over to youtube.com backslash real blend podcast uh, leave us a comment down below at the end of this episode. I'm actually going to give you guys a call to action that is going to deal with the DC universe. And it's in those comments of the YouTube channel where we want you guys to be able to weigh in. Uh, of course, we have a podcast available, uh, all the different places where you get your podcast needs met. So make sure that you if you just want to listen to the audio version while you're driving around or exercising or doing something cool like that, just find us where you get that. But then we also have the Real Blend Premium. And in, uh, when you sign up for the Real Blend Premium, you get a newsletter every two weeks from me and you get an ad free version of the show, which I think is a uh, reason enough for people to sign up for Roblin premium because who doesn't like to hear more from me <laughs> except for you guys, essentially, because <laughs> you hear enough from me um, and you've all heard enough from me at this point right now because you want to get to our interview of the week. And this one is a really great one. So we each did uh, television for the Flash Junket. Got a chance to speak to the Muschietis, but then we had them on the show so we can dive deeper into the filmmaking process. And they talked at length about how Ezra acts opposite Ezra, which we thought was really fascinating. Um, their approach to bringing uh, Michael Keaton's Batman back, which was fantastic. And a lot of other really interesting things that you guys are going to want to hear about with regards to The Flash. So without further ado, this is Andy and Barbara Muschietti talking to us about their new film, The Flash. <laughs> I want to start here and, and talk about how these multiverse stories, whether it be Spider-Man No Way Home or, or Doctor Strange most recently, have given fans the opportunity to see uh, actors that they love in these roles that they have made famous. Um, but in, in these are only possible if the person that you're going after says yes. Um, and so in the case of your film with Michael Keaton, uh, I'm just curious at what point in the process Keaton committed to it. Um, and, and is there even a movie if he decides <laughs> like you pitch him this whole thing and he says, nah, I'm not I'm not interested in that. Does, do you guys just pull the plug at that point? No, well, we, 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 there was a movie before we 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 thought of, of Keaton coming back. There was a movie that was probably a little less exciting. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, the idea fell on the table and we were like, this is brilliant. Um, we, uh, yeah, from this moment on. But I, I don't think there was any way back. I mean, we, we sat down with no, Keaton and, we, yeah. you know, uh, when we pitched him the story, we said, there is no movie without you. So, um, you know, that movie in particular. Um, and um, he understood what we wanted to do. Um, he thought about it for not not that long and and he said okay i'll i'll do it um and then there were you know little um adjustments um with andy and and christina discussing um, well there were, there were a yeah. lot of conversations you know because he was excited as much as i was about uh bringing batman to life but there was a lot of uh, there was a lot to talk about uh, where do we find where do we find uh, bruce wayne 30 years after we saw him for the last time uh, I wanted to I wanted to to find Bruce in a place where people do not expect to find him uh, a moment of his life where people mm. are excited. so I basically like it's a it's a Batman that quit 
uh, some years ago for a reason that you won't see in the movie, but you're going to see it in the deleted scenes when you see that <laughs> scene where they explain why uh, Batman quit. Um, of course, you can't he just tease that, Andy. You can't just dangle that out there. That's 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 me. He did something. <laughs> let's say let's say he did something that he's not uh, he's not proud of. Uh, he made a mistake. Right. And the, the the very reason that he knows so much. I mean, when when you were watching the movie, you didn't you didn't wonder how does he know much so much about time travel? Yeah. Okay. Oh. No. Okay. Oh, so he, did, <laughs> oh, so he must he must have made a similar mistake then. Well, maybe he tried <laughs> to fix things to like fix save his, his parents. parents from being like killed. Save his yes. parents. Mm. Whoa! Oh, oh, wait, 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 did you did you film a scene of Keaton going back no. to that, that moment? No, I didn't. I, I, I no. I, I never said that he achieved it. I never said True. that he managed to uh, travel back in time. But you know, I think he made a mistake, and he, that he couldn't live with. And um, mm. of course, if you see the movie, he says he has a whole narrative about it, and he says, "Well, Gotham, when when the Barrys ask him, how what you don't want to be Batman anymore?" And he's like, "Well, Gotham doesn't need me anymore. It's one of the safest cities in the world." Mm -hmm. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> In what universe? In what universe? Yeah. Gotham is the safest city, safest city in the world. Right, so it's right, right. it's a thing that you can believe or not. And and in this scene, in this deleted scene, uh, they're like they're traveling to to Siberia, and the, and the two berries are like you know whispering in the back, and it's like oh. well no, anyway, no. I'm not gonna ah, I'm not gonna ah, spoil it. Ah. This all comes from from discussing the the Batman, uh, the state that we're, we're Batman, we found Batman in, and this is one of, one of the discussions I had with uh, ongoing conversations I had with uh, with Keaton, and we finally agree that 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 we would find uh, Bruce in that state, in that at that time, having quit being Batman and a reluctant hero. I needed that okay. transformation to happen in the in this movie. Um, definitely didn't want. Uh, uh, of Bruce Wayne that was, you know, basically in front of his fireplace, just like stirring a, a, glass, of, a glass of whiskey, just like nothing happened. Um, anyway, but we, we had a beautiful, it was beautiful work that, that, that I did with, that we, that we had with, with Keaton. And, uh, and of course, it's so much fun, you know, to speculate about yeah. things that, 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 that are sort of, sort of so iconic, which is not only the character, Bruce Wayne, but also what is the future? What was the future of that movie? You know, what, mm -hmm. what, what, it's like, I know, and you can see it in the design of things. Uh, you, you see the Batcave, you see the, the costume, the Batman suit, the, the, the Batwing. It, they all have different uh, alterations that talk to you about a, an evolution in, in, in his work as Batman. Mm -hmm. uh, all the years that he continued being Batman after we last saw him in Batman Returns. Uh, the only like thing a that nightmare sequence is a nightmare sequence. Batman suit it looked like almost. <laughs> like a, yeah. Well, there's really a second. The only thing that didn't change is the is is the Batmobile. I wanted to keep that uh, basically untouched because it's one of those yeah. iconic things that you re really don't want to change. So. Mm -hmm. That's my and favorite the, Batmobile, the, to be honest. It is. And then I want to see the deleted scene with uh, Batman and Pennywise, too. Hopefully you put that one out as well. I, 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 <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't you that. like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy, there's, there's no way you remember this moment, but in February of 2020, um, basically a month before the world shut down, Sean and I bumped into you um, outside of a hotel in London because we were in London covering the Birds of Prey junket. And it was just a very friendly, very quick, you know, and we just said, hey man, how's, how's the flash going? And you said, oh, it's, it's going great. And I think we said something like, is it going to be awesome? And you said, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, something along the lines of, you have no idea. <laughs> and, and now that, and that was before we knew anything about Michael Keaton coming back or what this movie was going to be. So I'm just sort of curious, if you could remember back to February of 2020, what did you know in that moment? Did you, when we bumped into you, did you know Michael was coming back at that moment? What, 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 what was going on when we bumped into you in that parking lot? Well, I couldn't find my wallet after we bumped into each other. <laughs> That's a, whoa, how do you think Sean paid for that shirt? 
true. That's <laughs> that's the one thing I remember. Uh, <laughs> now it's a bit blurry. Of course, I remember bumping into you, but I can't. I, I very often I forget what I say. Uh, <laughs> most of the times is uh, most of the times is a bluff. So uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I think I guess I would have been very excited about about something. Uh, mm -hmm. Mainly the you know the the new discoveries. If if this was during the shoot, no no no, it was oh. and the, it was when we went to London to crew before the pandemic. This was January. Uh, cool. January of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, right before, yeah, right before oh, the yes. world shut down. Okay, yes. okay, okay. I was probably probably uh, thinking of, of of something that nobody knew at that point, which was Keaton. And, sure. Uh, gotcha. Keaton. I was probably thinking that this would remain a secret until the day of the release. <laughs> <laughs> we were so naive. We were so naive. We were like, we can't tell anybody, okay? Wait, was that going to be a plan to try to keep that a secret? Yeah, absolutely, it was. Oh, but, I mean, luck. it fell. It fell to pieces. Obviously, the the you know the probably the, around the time that 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 Keaton uh, you know accepted to play the role, and there was like the, all these like announcements and stuff. But I think that uh, yeah, for I mean, you 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 have these ideas that are uh, that are like fantastic. It, it, it relates to everything you do in a movie. You have this this. Um, dreams and, and ideas that are fantastic and then uh, for some reason they they, 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 they change they, they get altered and the movie is nothing like what the script is you know I mean of course it's, it's, it's the blueprint of, of what the movie is but the movie changes in so many ways and so like this dreams of secrecy something that you thought it would be a secret gets exposed you have to create new secrets <laughs> and so okay. with this I'm telling you that on the 16th you're gonna you're gonna have to see things that nobody will you know that you would you will not expect well that, okay. that's actually that actually leads me to my question because when when the film started there was a message from both of you that said this is not the finished film and so you're alluding to things that are going to be different can, can you speak a little bit on what we saw versus what everyone's going to be seeing on the 16th like what will be different will be, there be shifts in dialogue will there be shifts in story like what, what, what's going to be different about it absolutely not we're not telling you anything we oh. will <laughs> it's just a few days you have to wait guys come on look, have a little yeah but we're spoiled Deal. that's the whole idea you can't yeah, tell we yeah, want like yes. we already like your movie's not even out and we want your deleted scenes already like we're, 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 we're spoiled children <laughs> right, i told so you my, enough my, yeah my, my my real question is about the how you film the scenes of the two barry we started talking about story and barry meeting himself uh of course you don't think about all the technical problems that you're going to face because it's all you know it's all excitement about story and characters and and events uh, and then you have to have to face the technical problem. My experience with double photography were 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 at, at, traumatic. <laughs> no, I mean we're at best. You know, the, the latest technology uh, is the motion motion control thing, which is basically a mechanized uh, crane with a mechanized head that repeats a movement. Uh, many times, but that entails sending the the actor back to to his trailer, to the trailer, and b come back like an hour later. With the other side of makeup and and hair, and we right, would have right. shot this in five years. It would have not been a, you know impossible. Yeah, so it was, that was that. prohibitive. Wow. Then the other techniques used in in like classic movies like Dead Ringers or or Multiplicity or, yes. or even like Adaptation. All these movies, by the way played by all actors that are in this movie. <laughs> So that would, yeah, so it, it, that would have made like the split screen would have made, even, even though Multiplicity had some uh, motion motion control stuff, early, early days of motion control, it it sets up for a, you know, for a very uh, un, not unliberated uh, aesthetic where the camera has to be fixed and stuff. And also the prohibitive uh, tempo. Also, anybody empty. who's worked with motion control, bless them because because the freaking thing breaks all the time. Oh. So um, you never make your days, it's impossible. So eventually we found this technology called volume capture, mm. which is basically a scanning, scanning of a performance. So it's a hundred cameras pointed at the actor. It's a photorealistic depiction 
of, 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 of the performance and it creates um, a CG acid that you can then like, you know, look Off the actual performance, basically. Of the actual performance. So it's both uh, hyper realistic because it's actually a hundred movie cameras, but uh, it becomes a, a digital asset that then you can locate, you can just position in whatever that other, other actor, the B actor, but if they touch, how do you make them touch? Because well, it's basically, just to describe our day, right? We would have Ezra playing either young Barry or original Barry. That would be decided depending on um, what character had the, you know, the most dramatic turn in the scene. So Ezra would play that. And then we had the wonderful Ed Wade, uh, who was, who's a body replica um, of Ezra's measurements, basically. And also an amazing physical performer, um, a dancer and a rugby player. And, um, and a great actor as well. Yeah. And Ed would play the other Barry. Um, oh, wow. So that was decided, um, you know, every day, depending on what was the heavier performance. And then wow. once that scene was edited, um, Ezra would come into the volume cap capture. This was weeks later, even months later, and play the other side. The other guy had a, a witness camera on top of his head that basically registered in a 360 fashion everything that he was looking. And that footage was basically played on the walls of the volume where Ezra would later uh, perform his capture. Holy their shit, capture. this meaning, is insane. Meaning That's that incredible. Ezra, months later after the edit, uh, they would be looking at, at their own, uh, at themselves. In the in the in the walls of the of the of the volume, uh, so all the all the eyelines would 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 be correct. Uh, of course, wow. this was a non-proved technology. It, it all it never it never landed in a in a movie before. This is sort of the first you know feature film that uh, that that has this technology. So there were a lot of things to 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 test. A lot of things to. Finesse, and uh, hopefully we had enough time during post production to for the for the people at at at, at Eyeline who, uh, who were responsible for this technology to to do those uh, those those uh, refinements. It's remarkable. I mean, honestly, like in the middle of the uh, of their conversations, I forgot I was wow. watching. Mm -hmm. I was watching two, uh, not watching two different people play. Right. Um, you, one forgets. It's like it's two different people. Even for us uh, who lived through the process, you forget it's uh, it's just one Ezra. Wow. Unbelievable. That's um, unreal. Man. Wow. There have been so many um, pre-release endorsements for this movie, which I have found to be hysterical. Like James Gunn obviously comes out and calls it, you know, a tremendous movie and, and he's behind DC and then and Stephen King coming out and saying that he supported it. And the one that I love is Tom Cruise. But Tom Cruise apparently like asked to see it early and then like said that it's the kind of movie that everybody needs right now like how do you guys react to that how does that feel to get the endorsement from the king of summer blockbusters well, no, it's Stephen King I'll, I'll <laughs> say it was a, with Tom Cruise it was a double punch because um, we heard um, we heard the news that he uh, had loved the movie and suddenly our assistant comes uh, running uh, to us and, and says you know, this was midday. Um, uh, Tom Cruise is on the line. Uh, and okay. And <laughs> I mean, we had, you know, 15, 20 minutes of the most supportive human being, no skin in the game. I mean, right. the guy had no reason to make this call. And he just devoted 20 minutes of his life to just throw flowers at Andy, at the cast, at uh, at yeah. everything, and um, just incredibly supportive. I don't think we'll ever forget that. It's just one of those forever moments. That's incredible. Wow. 
Wow. And then he that's said, I'm going to kick your ass later on in Mission Impossible. <laughs> 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 no, no, by the time yeah, Mission in comes, we'll be, you know, we'll be good. Yeah. No, but it's, it's <laughs> certainly it was, it was magnificent to, to, to hear someone that, was, that loves movies so much. He loves movies so much that he, you know, he picks up a phone and 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 and, and is ready to, you know, to praise a, a, a job well done. Uh, I was, you know, of course we didn't know that it was a, you know, it's not just Tom. It's it's, it's basically the reactions of the audience. Once once you you finish a movie, you're like hoping that this is as good as you think it is and but it's really not until an audience you're watching a movie in a, in a movie theater with an audience that you realize that you know people laugh at the right time or just sob the right time or they get excited with a with a chase or etc etc et and then mm -hmm. Stephen King will be brief that Stephen King um I don't know what to say. He's the greatest human being. <laughs> Do you know they're watching it before they watch it? Like, are, are you so, like, like, you know, Stephen King's in the theater watching? Are you like sitting there for two hours, just like, pant, like freaking with, out about what his reaction is? With be? Tom, we didn't even know that he was watching it. We didn't know. And uh, with uh, Stephen King, we knew that he was watching it because. Um, we know what theater he loves to watch it and made and the, and the whole thing. Uh, but again, just he had no skin in the game and no reason for, you know, for that love and just, you know, pure, pure love. And, and, and he went with his wife, Tabitha, you know, we'll never forget that again. Wow. My gosh. I hope you guys didn't freak out over the format that Cruz got to see it in, because I would have been like... Get him to an IMAX, IMAX. theater. Yeah, get him in a 190. I need the 190 IMAX. Well, they know, they know we don't let the the movie be pixed, like sent through, like, a, we were like, absolutely no, no way. That's a great system, you know, it's a great system to see dailies. No one can watch this movie on Pix. Right. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of support in that. So they always make sure that it's watched in like, IMAX or the best, you know, yeah, yeah. No one watches yeah. it, yeah. All right, they are screaming at us, so we have to let you guys go. You are very much in demand, but we love getting a chance to speak to you guys, and congratulations on the film. Thank you so much for coming back no, on the show. Thank you, really thank you for it. the great questions, and and uh, uh, stand by for some more surprises in June 7th. Hey, we're ready. We're ready. Yeah. We're ready. Yeah. We're both on as soon as you guys come back anytime. Thank you, guys. It's so great to see you both working yeah. together. It's so cool. Hey, oh, guys. Good day. Bye, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you we want to thank Andy and Barbara, of course, for joining the show. It's always good to speak to them, especially ahead of a massive release like The Flash, which is going to have a lot to do for the DC universe uh, in terms of bringing it some closure, maybe even opening up some questions for um, what is to come. Uh, Jake, I know you were so huge on uh, Keaton coming back for Batman and that idea that, you know, they basically didn't have a film if Keaton didn't say yes. What did what'd you think about when we when Andy talked about meeting us in London and what he knew at that point? Well, you know, what's funny is that, uh, you know, because it's always one of those things that you have to remember that whenever you meet a celebrity, like you're just a small, you know, it's a big part of your day, but you're just a small part of theirs because of how much they have going on. You mean um, when I, he met us? Is that what yes. you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, so I try to, um, you know, I try to try to keep that in mind. But I think the thing that I walked away from uh, with that interview is what and I love that Barbara joined us. But what information could we have gotten out of him if she wasn't there? Because there were a couple of moments where it felt like he was really about to dive into something. Yeah. And then luckily for them. She was there to go, no, 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 no. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. And the whole time, of course, which is just, uh, you know, a dagger in the heart of podcasts trying to get, uh, you know, big, big scoops out of them. Uh, but, it, you know, for everything that he told us, and I feel like we got some good stuff out of that interview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just makes me wonder, what didn't we get because she was sitting next to him? Well, there was that deleted scene that he apparently is super keen on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if that either gets released you know, fairly soon now that the movie is out or at least some sort of description about it. So sure. uh, we will continue to dance around it because at this point, you know, we're going to wade into spoiler free reactions to The Flash. Um, and the boys want to at least comment on the fact that the version that they saw uh, is still the CinemaCon version, which sure. had a couple of scenes left out of it. And so to be fair to the movie uh, and to be fair to everyone who's watching it, they can only react to that 
uh, version that they saw. Um, I can tell you guys that having seen the finished version as well at a press screening, there's not much different. It's really only the closing minutes of the film that that changed. There wasn't drastic stuff that was uh, really different from it. But um, I'll give my spoiler free reaction and just say that. It, so having seen it twice, I can tell you guys that I had a lot of fun with it both times through. I thought it was a really good time. I thought it moves really quick. I think Ezra is actually terrific as playing the two berries because I think the portrayals of the different berries uh, were were really different and and really strong the way that they bounce off of each other. Hearing Andy talk about how they captured that, you know, using the volume capture and had Ezra essentially being able to look around in 3D and see themselves was really remarkable. Um, and I think the comedic timing between the two of them is fantastic. But I'd be lying if I said that one of the things that nitpicks Kevin about it is the visual effects. And I saw that a lot more uh, that second time through where I I think I was just paying a little bit more attention to like, oh, this could have baked in the oven (laughs) probably a little bit more. And I know that we've talked about the pipeline, the VFX pipeline being backed up because of all these different projects that need to get at it. And and right as we were going on to record this week's episode, uh, Disney announced a full slate of changes, you know, that you guys can go read about in the different trades. And I think that that's going to help the VFX pipeline. But Kev, talk a bit about the VFX, because I think you're right in that aspect. Yeah. And the, and the Disney uh, news that came out right as we were recording, didn't it say that the the Avatar films will be going through 2031? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They said the last one, Avatar 5, by, by this calendar and keep in mind avatar 2 was delayed multiple times because of obviously the co- you know covid and everything uh, but as of now avatar 5 if it were to come to fruition would be released in 2031 right and, and which this would be 22 also... years after the first one i think i'm this... going to be retired by then i honestly think i'll be <laughs> retired by 2031 <laughs> But you still got to come to the junket, though. OK, fair enough. And, you know, I mean, Sean will be Sean will be 98 by that point. So we'll, <laughs> he'll have to uh, no. But in in terms of the flash. Uh, so as as Sean mentioned, Jake and I have only seen the CinemaCon version. But as Sean mentioned, the only really big difference is the is the is the ending couple minutes of it, which um, which I haven't seen. I don't know Kevin, much. Do about you know what that. it is? Uh, I've, I, I, when I, when I, when I was talking to my, yeah, yeah, I know bits and pieces of it, but I haven't seen it. I don't want to know too many details. Um, the flash is a very fun film. It's a, it's a crowd pleasing film. It's a film. And again, my review is based on the cinema conversion and it plays like a rock concert. I mean, Mm -hmm. it genuinely does like at least for me, the first act of the movie is the strongest. Uh, the stuff, uh, you know, you see the trailers. This is not a spoiler. You know, Ben Affleck's Batman is in this. You know, Michael Keaton's Batman is in this. You know, General Zod as Michael Shannon uh, performance is back. Um, these are all not spoilers. So all those things play into the idea of how much fun this this universe is. Um, I did find the third act to be very video game like. Um, Hmm. And I know Gabe's not here because Gabe wants Gabe wanted to defend that comment. And he's not wrong. There are great video games out there right now that are done through performance capture, like Last of Us and things like that, where games Hmm. are actually using actors in suits like Andy Serkis, who does Gollum and, you know, Lord of the Rings uh, and Caesar in the Apes films similar to that. So the performances and, 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 and the way video games are being done these days is extraordinary. But in my mind, a video game looks like a video game. I'm not saying it doesn't look good. It looks great and it does work emotionally. But there's a difference in my head between a video game cutscene or a video game playable scene and a movie. Um, And when you're dealing with a movie with actual live action actors who are then input into a very heavy CGI sequence, there is a part of your mind that is going to disconnect if you're not immersed in it completely. Mm -hmm. Now, every person's different. I find myself to be someone who wants to sit down and enjoy a film, but I also know that there's a suspension of disbelief that happens when you're watching a movie. And when that breaks, it does remind you and pulls you out that you're watching a movie. Um, So the third act to me just played out genuinely like a video game. And I've seen like I've seen clips of the third act that have been you know released in the trailers and things like that. And and obviously the scene that I saw when I fully watched the cinema conversion of the movie It just took me out. It felt like a gigantic CGI video game battle. But I will say 
uh, outside of that, there are some really cool CG effects, especially in the beginning when we're dealing with the Flash and kind of what's going on with the character and what's, you know, there's some really cool like vertigo shots that Andy does with with Flash's foot as the world expands beyond him and like a vertigo type shot or dolly zoom type shot. Um, but I will say on a positive note, Michael Keaton is extraordinary in the film. Um, my favorite part of the movie is Michael Keaton. I think he's great. I think Ezra's performance is great in terms of playing both Barrys. And I do feel that there's some really cool shots and sequences. The Ben Affleck stuff was incredible. Yeah. I just couldn't get behind the third act. So I like the film. And, you know, with the Internet these days, if you just like a movie, you apparently hate the movie. Um, no, I, I thought it was a solid film. I was I, I enjoyed myself watching it. It went by very fast. No pun intended. I just had some issues with the CGI. And I also just felt the story felt like something I've seen a million times. I feel like mm -hmm. I've seen this story play out about a character going back in time, trying to change things and how that messes up and disrupts the timeline. It just felt familiar. So dialogue, I kept going, oh, here comes this line. Here comes that line. Here comes that plot point. So I'm kind of, I, I liked it. I just didn't love it. You know, what's interesting is you mentioned that and Michael Shannon made similar comments, you know, while doing press for it, where he was like, it didn't feel like I returned to the Man of Steel world. It didn't feel yeah. like it, he goes, it felt like I was playing with action figures. And yeah. so, you know, it's interesting to hear someone who's involved with the project come away with that, uh, that that takeaway. Um, but Jake, there's something that you said shortly after you saw it that stuck with me is that you thought you should have been having more fun with it, especially the Keaton bits. Yeah, you know, it's the, the movie is a lot more of a mixed bag than I thought it was going to be. Um, as I think about it, it's been a few weeks since I've seen it. Um, and there were multiple moments whenever I was watching the movie when I was watching things unfold on screen and I was registering what I was seeing. Mm. And as I'm watching it, I'm just thinking, why aren't I more excited to see this? Like, Did on you feel paper, that, uh, yeah, I fun. felt that way. I felt no, no, I, I felt that way to Jake's point. I, I will I'll use this term lightly. There's a lot of fan service in this movie. Mm -hmm. And there are moments that are meant to be gigantic crowd pleasing moments that I wish I had more fun experiencing. But they, but it bothered me because it felt forced. But go yeah, ahead, okay. Jake. Yeah. And uh, like there were just moments where. If you were to write down on a paper something that happened in the movie and hand it right. to me five years ago, I'd read that and go, no, there's no <laughs> way. You're telling right. me Michael Keaton is back as Batman and he does this in a movie? Yeah. And then I'm watching it going, huh, like that's, that's okay. Like there it is. Do you All think right. they teased too much or showed too much of, of him in the I marketing think, I stuff? Think, I, I do think that's a big part of it. I think, you know, it would have been great to hear him say, uh, you want to get nuts, let's get nuts, yeah. you know, for yeah, the yeah. first time. I right. mean, it even goes as far as, you know, what Andy told us in the interview was they did not want to reveal that he wasn't even in the movie at all. Right. Like, could you imagine being in and we also talk about this in the past with Thor Ragnarok, how great it would have been to just be in the theater when Thor burst you know, into that Coliseum. Hulk, imagine, yeah, imagine, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm trying to think of like how big the, the moment would have been uh, when when we saw Michael Keaton. You can't, you can't judge a movie based on a hypothetical scenario in which it didn't come out, but it doesn't change the fact that like there were too many moments where I thought, I'm, I'm just not as excited or into this moment as I should be knowing what's happening in front of my eyes. Interesting. There, there were a couple of, I feel like tonally the movie sort of hopped all over the place. And, and you know, yeah. whenever I say mixed bag, I'm just on complete opposite end of the spectrum because there are moments that I'm like, oh my God, you know, I really yeah. loved Sasha Callie as Supergirl. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to see a lot more of her. Um, you know, I and, and, and you know, I, I, I love Michael Keaton, um, but I agree with Kevin. I, the, there are moments where I just thought, how, how is this a $200 million movie with yeah. those degree of special effects? Um, there are moments, a lot of moments in the movie where, and if the Fablemans has taught us anything, it's not to do this, with the horizons in the middle of the of the frame <laughs> and it's just like come on right. guys we saw right. the, we saw the fablemans and you know whenever i talk about the tone i think a, a really interesting watershed moment for people is going to be very early on in the film in a scene involving falling babies i, I hated that, that scene, scene. I love it too. I, I hated that scene and i, I feel like scene. it involves a, a, a lot of humor and I think that that moment is going to determine how you feel about a lot of the other humor moving forward. That's interesting. Um, 
So uh, that's so that. So again, uh, there's a lot of stuff about it that I liked, um, but unfortunately, there is, there was a lot more stuff about it that I disliked than I thought there was going to be. And for a movie in which things happen that I, I, I five years ago I never would have thought would have ever happened on a big screen, I am not as wowed by seeing them happen as I feel like I should be. Yeah, and that scene with the babies is probably my favorite scene in the whole film. So wait, so so really? Jay, so yeah, yeah, I love that whole first act. Everything with, wow. with I, I won't say anything else, hilarious. but I, um, I know that we got to move on. So Jake yeah. and I, as we mentioned, that's the version that we saw. Sean has seen both. So Sean, where are you? You can actually you give a rating because you've seen the final version. So where, where are you? Yeah, at? I, I, I finish at a four out of five. I mean, I still okay. think that for a Flash movie and, and especially the way that they utilize the character's powers mm. and the fact that I saw some really amazing things that I never thought I would see on screen before. I do love the Affleck Batman stuff in the beginning. Great. It's great. Um, I loved Sasha Kali, Sasha Kali as, as Supergirl. I hope she gets an opportunity to continue to do what she's doing. Um, those final moments, I want to hear from you guys after you see it, uh, because I want to know what you guys think of the reveal Kevin, are you going that, back? that we get. Well, and then and I'm glad Jake asked that. So people listening, and this is kind of what with the new version of our show is we're, we're trying to bring you more behind the scenes of, of how our show yeah, explain operates it. and what we're explain doing. It. So Jake and I, the reason we saw a CinemaCon version is because we had to see the cut that was available prior to the junket interview yes. um, that we had with uh, Andy and Barbara and, and Sasha. Um, so by the time the final cut started making its rounds into press screenings, Jake and I were traveling. We had <clears throat> press junket and other screenings that we were doing like Asteroid City and, um, you know, Pixar's, Pixar's Elemental. So it, it, it's people, you know, people might message us and go, wait, isn't it your job to, you know, go see X, Y and Z? I'm like, yeah, we saw it for our interviews. It's not our job to haven't. see it twice. But you know well, what? I mean, though? What's yeah, interesting yeah. is there are <laughs> moments where with a, with a couple of these big title films where we only get to see maybe 20, 25 minutes sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So in a way. I actually appreciated that the Flash was able to show as much as they did uh, while see, still I, I, keeping some of it secret, you know, still I, protecting push back on that. I honestly can't stand this new world that we're in where we're not allowed to see either either the full thing or anything at all. Or they show 30 minutes like I'm sorry, like we are members of the press. We are trusted to be right. put into a position yeah, to interview that. talent yeah. like trust that we can be adults and be professionals and see your film without spoiling things. And I'm sorry. Hold Hold the people who are spoiling things accountable. Like yeah. there are too many moments where because they're a big, massive organization or publication that they can spoil things with no repercussions whatsoever. And they still get the opportunity to do it time and time and time again. And I'm sorry, like if like like we are should be able to see things. We shouldn't be forced to do interviews or, or, or tiptoe around reviews uh, because we're not trusted to see the, the final film. Like, I, I just, I, I really don't like that that's this reality that we're living in right now. I will say this, one of the times that I actually agreed with it was I was in LA and I had a, this was so crazy. I, I saw, um, I was there in LA for The Hateful Eight and Star Wars The Force Awakens and I had both junkets the next day. And so, you know, Quentin Tarantino, the whole cast of Hateful Eight and then the whole cast of Force Awakens. I'm glad that I didn't see Force Awakens prior to that interview with Harrison Ford, because knowing what happens to Han Solo in that, uh, you know, in that scene, I think would have been what emotionally. <laughs> well, Sean hasn't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> spoiler alert, if you haven't seen The Force Awakens, but Han Solo's <laughs> death scene, which I think is one of the greatest scenes ever in Star Wars film history. I love that scene so much. I don't know that I could have done that interview yeah. the way I had done that interview with the excitement and the and uh, had I seen that scene, I, I, it would it, it would have been a weird thing. And I know with like Infinity War and Endgame, they did the same thing. Um, I do think it's OK for like certain things with the Flash, for example. I agree with Jake. I think that that is a the thing that we apparently missed it's not such and a it's massive out deal, right? And, and and so like in that case, that does frustrate me because I would like to sit here and give a full rating review of this movie, um, but because well, we haven't finished it, we can't. So we can just I will react tell to you what guys we saw. That at CinemaCon, when we saw that first version, and this is weeks before we knew that there was even going to be another version. Once it ended, we. Uh, all of us turned to each other and were like, I don't think that's the real end of the movie. Like it <laughs> felt like it was cutting itself off 
in, yeah. on purpose. So yeah. you knew they were almost holding back something. So all right, really quickly, because we only have a couple more minutes left in the show, uh, we all got a chance to see a film in preparation for a junket that's about to happen. And we wanted to at least give it some uh, attention because uh, it's it's really uh, something cool. And it's Extraction 2, which is Chris Hemsworth's franchise that is uh, available to you on Netflix. Uh, the first one is at least Extraction 2 is coming on the 16th of June. So today, basically, today. as you're listening to this episode, yeah, you guys can go over and watch Extraction 2. Uh, and it, it's a great sequel. It's a terrific follow up to what is probably an underrated action movie in Extraction. Uh, that first one's brutal. It's got some great action set pieces in it. Hemsworth's character is resilient as anything and is one of those. It reminds me of the raid that by the end of it, the mm. guy is just beaten to daylight. But he gets his ass kicked, which is through. important. And we, we talk about that a lot, how so many action stars won't allow themselves to have their ass kicked. And, and what I appreciate is that Hemsworth does like he he is he's, he's Thor. But he also recognizes that it's not going to matter a damn bit if he can't get shot or get, you know, or, or match up with someone who can kick as much ass as he can. Like, it's, right. that's what makes these movies work. Well, that vulnerability is important because like, I remember I remember interviewing Bob Odenkirk for Nobody. And he was so happy that I because I brought up this moment in when he's fighting on the bus and he remember he like he gets thrown back and like lands in that seat and he falls down. And it was just like this moment that showed the vulnerability that this guy is not a superhero. He's still a yeah. person, even mm -hmm. though he might have these incredible skills. That's why, it's you know, even with like Die Hard and things like that, where John McClane, he gets injured and, and hurt. You got to see these guys get hurt so you can see their vulnerability yeah. so that you can actually connect to it. If they're just walking through a scene without any hesitant or, or adversity, it just it just feels numb. Um, so I, th I definitely got to give Sam Hargrave credit. And the guy who directed Extraction 1 and 2, Sam Hargrave, um, he did the second unit shots um, on Infinity War. So he, if I'm correct on this directed the thor entrance into wakanda yeah i think he did yeah in infinity war so if you love that scene as much as i do the guy who directed that scene uh for the russos is directing this movie and the first extraction this is written by joe russo as well obviously so it's all connected to the to the avengers world in some but way But listen give me more extraction than gray man to be honest with you yeah i think oh the movies are more entertaining and and the character development and it is what i want to point out as well too like there's uh some significant tragedy in this he's got a terrible action name his name is T tyler rake i kind of love a, it and i kind of no, love that they sort of make fun of it in extraction too it's just lame it's such a you're lame, lame action hero. you're lame <laughs> name um you're, you're named after you, sean penn and walter mitty calm down do you think Tyler rakes or blows his leaves? Like, like oh when he, like God. when he's, when he's, no, well, like, you know, I don't think they ever considered calling the character Tyler blows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so anyway, with Extraction 2, yes, it continues more of the character development. I actually did like this. I don't want to spoil any of it, but there are sequences that show because he was he was allegedly dead at the end of the last mm -hmm. episode. And they take a, a decent amount of time explaining how they're bringing him back. Mm -hmm. It's not just with a sequel where like all of a sudden he emerges from the shadows yeah. and it's like, no, I wasn't gone this whole time. And I love that sort of character development. I love the way it sort of builds up the physicality of the character. Um, there is one significant sequence in this movie that's getting a lot of attention heading into it it's being billed as a 21 minute uh oneer and we've had been having a conversation in our text thread about it because it has stitches and if anyone's listening to you know multiple episodes uh of real blend you guys know that we go back and forth in terms of especially with 1917 and a lot of other films that that use the concept of the oneer to really impress you um in this one in particular it goes on for so long. Um, it involves so many different action set pieces that for the first time I understood what Kevin was saying, that once you start to be thinking about how it's being shot in the moment, it took me out of the moment. Now, I still appreciated all the choreography that goes into it. And some of the things that happen over the course of this one are, are fantastic. And I, oh, yeah. I will definitely want to see it again. But there are places where I was like, oh, I wish that if they were really doing this practically, mm. I want to my brain to sort of think of how did you pull that off kind of thing versus, you know, it's they, a, OK, they I'm, on the flip side of that, as, as someone who enjoys the editing process and, and I edit a lot of my stuff here in the station, I think I appreciated it more from honestly from the stitches the idea really? of like wow this really like narrative wonder because I don't think anyone's going into this 21 minute wonder particularly where it starts and where it ends 
actually thinking they pulled it in one shot. And right. so for me, right. the fact that like the fact that it for the most part looks like a one -er, yeah. to me that's that's the thing that impresses me is the is the, the photography and the editing made to to utilize the concept of the wonder not not me imagining that they actually pulled it off but me like realizing on a technical level how much artistry went into making it look like they pulled it off okay yeah i mean for for me and there there's two conversations here i know we only have a couple minutes left so i'm going to keep this brief so Wonders are something that I've always been very fascinated by because they're an immersive storytelling tool. They're meant to keep you in the moment. The break of, a, of an edit theoretically would, you know, if it's done well with an edit, you shouldn't notice it. But if you're going through a sequence in a, in a one shot, there is something uh, immersive about that. I think some of the greatest wonders of all time, Children of Men, especially the motorcycle sequence with the ping pong ball. I, th I think that's a, a true wonder. And then later at the end of the film is a classic wonder, which has, a, I think, one or two stitches that Alcoran did with Chivo. I remember um, seeing that for the first time and, and thinking how magnificent that, that sequence mind was. Mind blowing. But the also ending, like, the you know, one. the old boy, the original old boy tracking shot, that's a true wonder. Um, but see, here's the thing. One of my favorite movies of all time is a movie called Rope, Hitchcock film, classic movie. It was the first time I understood how a filmmaker could use long shots and cover the edits. Because back then you had film magazines that only could shoot for a certain number of minutes. So you had to go behind a black jacket or go behind a desk mm -hmm. and then you pick the shot back up. And that's how you stitched a one shot together. Nowadays, like films like Birdman, they do it in very clever ways where they'll go underneath a stage or they'll do something to hide the wonder. My problem with 1917, which was presented as a one shot throughout, is that I found myself thinking that I couldn't stop thinking about Deacons filming it to try to find the next place to cut. Hmm. So like in my head, I'm not saying that you can't watch a wonder that has stitches and be immersed. You can. It's been done a million times. But in this case and like 1917, I found myself distracted by watching the camera look for the edit. Like it's basically like a like a camera pushes into a wall or pushes into a glass and it only does it to, in my opinion, to cover the shot, which is fine. Um, it's a very cool sequence. There are later action sequences in this film that I think are better. That yeah, are actually no, have, I agree. That, ha I agree. that have obvious edits. Um, and I think this scene, this 21 minute wonder, could have been like, you know, like six, you know, five or six, five minute shots or whatever it would have been. Um, and I think they could have done the obvious edits and it would have been cleaner. That's just me. But anyway, so I know we got to move on, but, but the movie's on say, Netflix today. I did really enjoy it. These are really yeah. solid action films. And Sam Hargrave is a great director because he's coming from that background. He understands like with Chad Stelhesky, for example, with John Wick. You know, you go you'll go back and find that interview. These guys understand action. So it it does play really well and it's fun. I'm just being nitpicky about the wonder aspect because it does, in my opinion, pull me out. And I think it pulled Sean out a few times. Well, but I think still, that there's just it, a moment, but it's still cool. It's still it's fun. Definitely it's definitely yeah. worth your time. I mean, if you yeah. like the first extraction, the oh, second yeah, one is fun. definitely worth yeah. your time. It gets yeah. to a point where it teases where a potential third one could go. And I can tell you at this point now, I'm very excited to see I'm where so that ends up. I'm so third one. Yeah, 100 percent, especially because there's a, an actor involved who, if they continue to go forward with this actor, uh, I would be really excited to see how they can fit we say in, so. is that a spoiler? I, yeah, I would not because I, I didn't can know we, the person was showing up. It's, uh, can we tease that it's a Thor reunion? Well, no, that's out there. Is it? I didn't know he was in yeah, it. There's a whole article. Um, I didn't know he was um, in it either. All right. So I, I'll just pull this up. So Extraction 2 director opens up on Idris Elba joining the Netflix sequel. And that's from Games Radar. It's also in uh, a bunch of I mean, Collider. All right. So Idris film. Elba is in yeah. the film. <laughs> yeah, he's so it's, be, it's out there. He's at the end of the film as well, too. So but he's he's really good at it. Um, we got to go. There's a lot of things to get to as well, too. And we have a lot of exciting episodes coming up, including uh, our visit to Pixar, which we're going to be able to dive into deep, 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 deep details about. Um, and uh, <laughs> ta -ta 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 today, Junior, I got an indie screening so I can actually talk to uh, da -da -da -da. you guys. Hey, Kevin, what are you, with you what are guys. You, uh, what are you doing this afternoon? Mm, shut up. I don't know. Oh, Jake, what are you doing? Uh, all I know is that I'm spending time with my good best friend. Me too. And, and, and I, I do want to say, because Sean kind of underplayed that, um, we all went to Pixar and oh. it was an extraordinary experience. 
And all three of us were there. We got to sit down in one of their offices and talk to the filmmakers uh, behind the film. And it's just a really special episode. I will tease ahead that Roger Deakins is somehow involved in this interview um, I didn't in, in, in terms of content. So also the Godfather. Uh, and Terminator, our, our 2. Show, Terminator, and 2. Terminator 2. Terminator 2. Yeah. Our Terminator show two. is designed to bring you behind the scenes. So make sure you tune in to the, the next episode that we do. We're going to basically take you behind the doors of Pixar and explain to you how it all operates, how Steve Jobs is involved. There's so many cool pieces of the story. So stay tuned for all that. Right. And in, in the meantime, in the place of where our normal real blend uh, game goes, the blend game, we are doing a call to action. And I want to hear in the comments down below from you guys or on social media. Who is your all time favorite Batman after seeing The Flash? And explain to me why as well, too. Follow us on social media at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach. And the show is at Real Blend. Like we said, Pixar next week. So until then, Oppenheimer, the man who moved the earth, and Barbie. <laughs>